Welcome to Bounce Back Stronger, the podcast that explores ways to find peace and purpose after difficulty. I'm your host, Donna Ferris, and today we have a truly remarkable guest joining us, author, journalist, and editor, Art Carey. A little bit about Art? With 34 years of experience as a reporter, staff writer, editor, and columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer, he has a wealth of experience to share. From covering national affairs to delving into health and fitness, Art has captured the essence of human resilience. Whether it's through covering stories of inspiration with well-loved celebrities like Fred Rogers or overcoming personal challenges, including depression. He also is the author of one of my favorite health and fitness books called Body for Life, which contains the accessible strength training routine I have been using for 21 years. I know it's 21 because I used it right after I had my second child. You must have read one of the original Body for Life books. Then. I did. I did. I got follow-up. it from one of my coworkers at SEI. So yeah, uh-huh. I loved it. So welcome to the podcast, Art. I'm so honored to have you uh, with us today. Well, thank you, Donna. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you for that very gracious and flattering preface. <laughs> Uh, well Introduction. deserved. Yes. <laughs> well deserved. So you focus on a wide variety of topics during your career. As I mentioned, health and fitness, your book on marriage, to the outdoors, most recently your project with your son and the main cabin. What drew to you to all these subjects and how did you approach them so well as a journalist? Well, that's one of the delights about being a journalist. It pays pretty lousy, but you have wonderful experiences and get to meet all sorts of interesting people. But I was never really a newsman. The news was sort of a means to an end. It was the writing and meeting interesting people and satisfying my curiosity that most appealed to me and that um, kept me content as a journalist. So the fitness thing kind of happened accidentally. Uh, I was an editor of the Sunday Magazine for many years, 13 years. And they decided to launch a uh, health and fitness section. And they decided, since I was the resident body Nazi, (laughs) to use Hunter (laughs) Thompson's term for fitness freaks, because I used to run at lunchtime with some of my buddies at the paper. And I was always walking around with my chest out and my um, muscles showing. So (laughs) they said they invited me to, to write a column about fitness. And I was delighted. I thought that would be a lot of fun. And it was. And so that's how I got a chance to express my passion for fitness, although it had been something that I was doing on my own ever since I was 12 years old, probably, Um, partly because of my grandfather, who was a magnificent physical specimen and was reading all sorts of crazy books by Adele Davis about nutrition and other books about how to achieve immortality. That's how fitness came about. And then I'd been doing that for a while. And when I got into my late 40s and 50s, I entered what Wordsworth called the years that bring the philosophic mind. (laughs) And I began to become more interested in what makes people tick, what sustains people, the passions and, and the beliefs and the philosophies, particularly the philosophies of life that lead to a meaningful existence. And so I proposed to my editors that I launch another column called This Life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and the title worked in two ways. It was usually a biographical sketch, but also it was a, a short profile that attempted to explore what is it that we're doing here? What is, it, what is this great, strange journey all about, to use Jack Kerouac's words? And that was really fun. I, I would say that those two years, 1998 to 2000, when I was doing both the fitness column and the this life column were probably the happiest of my life. I really felt fulfilled because as I said, I used to do bodies on Monday and minds Mm -hmm. and souls on Thursdays. And it developed quite a following. I think it was just the right column at the right time for a lot of baby boomers who were at the same juncture in their lives. Right. Trying to keep fit and trying to understand what their lives are all about. Yeah. Yeah. And it was also a way, uh, selfishly, it was a way for me to tap other people's wisdom yeah, and then to share it with my readers. And that was really, really felt like I was doing something useful. Um, Yeah, I think I I can relate a lot to that. We were talking a little bit about the impetus for the podcast, and I think that's a lot of what I feel like I'm doing myself. So I do relate to that. Well, Roger, Roger Rosenblatt was one of the people that I interviewed and got to know a little bit. 
Do you know who he is, Roger Rosenberg? I, I don't. He used to write wonderful essays in the back of Time magazine. Oh wow! And then he was a, a he he also was a an on air essayist for the PBS NewsHour. Oh wow! He used, he used to deliver weekly essays, but when I interviewed him because I had a crush on him because he's such a wonderful writer, he mentioned a story that he did, a profile that he did of the fa famous physician philosopher, Lewis Thomas, who said that with the same insight that we have about our flaws and shortcomings, we should also take into account the many ways in which we have achieved goodness mm -hmm. and particularly the many ways we be, which, which we are useful and more specifically, uniquely useful. Mm -hmm. So I love that term, uniquely useful. Mm -hmm. Because I think yeah. that's something that we can all strive for and also achieve because we're all unique and we can figure out a way to be useful in a way that nobody else on the planet is. Yeah, to tap into another PBS uh, show, Thomas the Tank Engine, all Thomas ever wants to be is a useful engine. And it is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently. Something I always talk to my kids about, you know, you would just really want to be useful and use your talent in the best yes. way possible yes. and be a team player at it. Um, so it's interesting. You bring up something that for me taps into something that I've been thinking a lot about. Mm. I think that's one of the joys of com having conversation is that you can, you know, see these ideas kind of float all over the place and they can mean so much to you when you hear them from somebody else. Yes. And, yeah. So it means it means we're not alone. Yes. And so the, the premise of the, this life column was that Number one, everybody has a story to tell. Everybody. And then and the, the number two premise was everybody has some wisdom to share. I love that. So that was fun. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Could you share some specifically or particularly inspiring profiles that you wrote during those times? Well, there's so many, so many, it's really hard to choose. But often after I would interview people, because they were usually pretty deep, soulfully interviews, one of my favorite ways of interviewing people was to take long walks at Haverford College. Oh, and wow. we would sit down at a bench, sometimes for three or four hours. Wow. And so the, the result was that many of these people became friends. The relationship didn't end with the interview. So two, two people in particular in, who fit into that, category or Jack Vogel, mm. who was the founding chairman of Vanguard, the great mutual fund giant. I think they have something like six trillion dollars under management now. And yeah. Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. And I ended up interviewing them several times and for several stories. And in the case of Fred, I became a pen pal. We exchanged letters and telephone calls. And, oh, and lovely. I think it's fair to say that he he really became a friend. In fact, That's wonderful. Let me see. Just excuse me for a second. Yeah. Here's a here's a letter from Aww. Fred. Oh, That's that amazing. He, that he wrote in response to the story about my grandfather's last six months that I wrote for the magazine. He insisted that I send him some of my favorite stories, so I did. And Aww. so uh, one of them was was that one. And his letter starts, "Well, Artie." You made me cry. Oh. And he goes on from there. That's wonderful. But that's the kind of guy he was. And yeah, there's sort of a funny story. I, I, so the first time I met him was when he came to Philadelphia because he had to do some business. His publisher was here. And I took advantage of that to, to interview him because I think it had just been announced that he was ending his show. Mm. And so I I went down to meet him in this office and that they was in a meeting with some other people. And as soon as I entered the room, he turned his attention directly to me and acted like I was the only person in the room and that he had all the time in the world just for me. So the first thing I said to him was, I like your bow tie because I'm a bow tie. <laughs> and he said, would you like to have it? Oh. <laughs> He's going to give me his bow tie. And then then he asked me if I had grown up with the neighborhood. And I said, well, the show didn't start till I was a senior in high school. And he couldn't believe how young I was, how young yes. I was. You know, I yep. was in my early 50s at the time. And th then I said, well, that's a wonderful compliment. Thanks very much. And I said, it really means a lot to me, especially yeah. now. Yeah. And then he said, 
what do you mean by that? His voice turned grave and he was very concerned. So that I, then I told him that sort of what I told you that I'm in a period in my life where I'm searching for meaning and trying to figure out what life's all about and I'm interested in people who are engaged in the construction of a soul. Mm-hmm. And so he said, that's wonderful. Then you need to read these two books. He scooted over to his briefcase and pulled out two books for oh, me, awesome. one about by a woman about a relationship with her grandfather and another about finding meaning in life. So that evening, he he was to be honored at a big gathering in one of the Center City hotels. And I went just to to watch and see the scene. And he has a shtick that is so affecting. At the beginning of his speeches, he, he announces to the audience that none of us would be here, would be who we are today, if it weren't for somebody, other people who took an interest in us and loved us and made us who we are. And he said, I would like now to take a moment of silence. And I want all of you to think of that person who helped make you who you are today and think how proud they would be to see who you've become. So inevitably, people start to tear up during mm-hmm. this moment of silence. Tearing up now a little bit. Thinking yeah. Of it. yeah. And, and it was just, I, I watched this very closely. It was especially interesting to see these hard charging businessman type guys who were jiggling their legs and suddenly it, it just melts them. Wow. So after the speech, I went up to, to congratulate Fred and he tore himself away from all these devotees and votaries and gave me a, a hug. Aww. And then the next day, which was a Saturday, the telephone rang at my house in the afternoon and my son, Teddy, who was about uh, maybe 10 or 11, called me and he said, Dad, Mr. Rogers is on the phone. (laughs) So I picked up the phone and Fred said, I just wanted to tell you how much fun it was to meet you and how much I enjoyed our conversation. And this may sound a little bit weird, but I wanted to ask you a couple questions. Um, Who are the people in your life who have loved you and who are the people that you love? <laughs> wow. And that was a, that's, that's a question that most people huh. can't answer off the top of their heads. No. But that was sort of the way he was. And yeah, I called him later in the week and we had a conversation for a couple hours. So he was really genuine. And that was not a shtick, right? But it kind of was his shtick. It's so real. It's not, it's not even something we're used to seeing. Well, I would have to say that he was probably, he's probably the most saintly human being I've ever met. Yeah. And I, I, I asked him some pretty hard questions at the beginning because I, I I have a, I think Hemingway talked about having a built-in shit detector and I'm very, (laughs) very cynical about people like that and wanted to see if his public persona matched who he really was yeah I I believe that that he was the real deal the real thing authentic kind decent giving person he wrote handwritten notes he would get up five o'clock in the morning he had a, a, a ritual but he would he would write handwritten notes to thousands and thousands of people a year and a lot of the people who watched his television show were not children, they were adults, mm-hmm. many of them going through difficult periods in their lives. And they would write to him, thanking him for saving their lives or making them feel worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. He was an uh, inspiration. One of the few shows that I was allowed to watch as a child, you know, on, on TV when I was little. So I did really love him. Um, maybe we switch a little bit here because I, I want to make sure that we get a chance to go through some of the other things that that we wanted to talk about. Um, maybe you mentioned your son, Teddy. Maybe we talk a little bit about the work that you just did with him in the, the main cabin. Um, oh, I'm really interested that... in that. That it seems like such a great uh, way to spend time with your your child, but also it, it kind of encompasses your interest in the outdoors and, and that being a, a way to soothe the soul. So I'd be interested to hear about that experience. 
Well, thank you, Donna. I'm delighted to talk about that. Um, <laughs> Because uh, well, the summer that we did that, summer of 2021, was probably the the best summer of my life and Aww. the thing about which I'm most proud. So in 1959, my grandfather took me to Maine and when I was a nine-year-old boy. We spent a, a magical month together, just he and I. And he was a wonderful role model, inspiration. And so I fell in love with Maine and became infatuated. And I vowed back then that someday I would return and build a lobster shack or a cabin <laughs> in the woods. So finally, uh, in 2021, everything aligned to make it possible. Teddy was at a transition point in his life. He was leaving Austin, Texas and was available to help me. So we spent four and a half months in the woods uh, on a piece of uh, land that we own and, and built a cabin from scratch. We originally bought plans, but once we got up there, we decided that we couldn't build the cabin. <laughs> oh my gosh. The the cabin that was described in the plans, it was a little bit beyond our ability. So Teddy ended up designing the cabin. He was sort of the wow. chief architect and engineer. And how many fathers get to spend four and a half months of exclusive intimate time with their grown sons doing yeah, something like no that? One does. Yeah. Yeah. It was just the most what a gift life-saving experience actually for both of us um hmm. it pulled me out of a of a of a 10-year depression and um hmm. it was also very beneficial for ted because he got his dad back um, he was yeah plus being I, in that I, incredibly gorgeous place and working with our hands and uh lots of very meaningful conversations and we got to know each other deeply <laughs> And you've written a few pieces, at least, about that, right? But are you going to write a book about that? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, I have written a book, which I haven't. It's it's finished. But now the process of of trying to find somebody who might publish it and sort of tinkering with it to make it commercially publishable, perhaps. Yes. I so it covers a lot of ground. What do you think about that experience helped with your depression? I'm just curious. What do you think was the catalyst? Well, I think I was already pulling out of it for, for a variety of reasons, thankfully, because it was 10 years. That's a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's a long time. But uh, to, to be engaged, I think that's the main main word, to be engaged in something meaningful. With purpose. And, yeah, with purpose and to be outdoors, be working mm -hmm. with my hands to have a sense of, of agency, mm -hmm. of being useful, being able mm -hmm. to do things and accomplish things, a sense of purpose. These are all the things that people will, all the sages of the ages say are essential to a, a sense of happiness or contentment. Uh, yeah. And being with, my, being with my son, being in this sacred place, this place that I love so much, being outdoors in the sunshine, fresh air, in nature. Yeah. Well, yeah. All the all the things that are almost guaranteed to make you feel good. Yeah, and and then it allowed you to write about it too, right? I mm -hmm. kept a journal up there, right? And that that actually here it is. Teddy gave this to me for oh, my wow. birthday. Can you see it? Main musings. I love it. Yeah. So he gave it to me back in two thousand nine originally. Uh, wait a sec. No, he gave it to me for my fifty third birthday. So that would have been. 2003 and I didn't do anything with it so he re-gifted it to me in 2009 <laughs> he said, hoping, hey. that, hoping that I would use it and so I did finally use it in the summer of 2021 I took it up there and that became the the book that I kept my journal in that's amazing um, and I was pretty disciplined about making sure that I made a daily entry and it that became the basis for the book that I've written it and yeah, there was some, lots of memory prompts in there. Yeah, well, that's really, really helpful. I think there's a lot of good things in, in all of the things you said that we talked with the different people that I've had guests the, on the show, the being outside, the having purpose, the mm -hmm. converting the feelings and the things that you're going through into writing or some sort of creative pursuit is really, really helpful. And then the connection that yes. you're having with your son is so powerful. Yes. 
And using your moving your body. That's another mm. thing that I preach. Would you, would yeah. you know that from your yoga? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah yoga. Is. It yeah. is. Well, it's another way to convert uh, the energy and the emotions that can kind of get stuck in your body. It helps to convert them through activity and, and moving. And yeah, it's really, really helpful. Yes, absolutely. I could have you back, I think, multiple times to <laughs> talk about all of the things. And I would like to do that. So I'm going to already ask you for that. But maybe before we tie up today, you could share one thing that you would like to, to let listeners know, maybe in today, in this time frame, or where we are today in, in the world, or just out of our conversation today. It's so easy to be despairing, I think. It's yeah. like, I guess you're familiar with Candide by Voltaire. I mean, and not as well as you are, but yes, character familiar. character in there named Dr. Pangloss, and he's <laughs> actually a, a, a satirical figure. He's yeah. meant to be somewhat ridiculous because he's sort of pathologically optimistic. Yeah. And one of the sayings that's attributed to him is, all is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. And mm -hmm. so Pangloss is actually a, a correct in him. It, Pan... It's pan meaning everything and gloss meaning everything is shiny and happy. But I think that if you have to choose between being pessimistic and cynical, it's probably best to err on the side of being optimistic and hopeful. Agreed. And that's pretty much the way I try to exist day to day. And sometimes I try to be militantly cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> P.K. Chesterton said, um, courage is the ability to be cheerful in circumstances we know to be desperate. Again, I think that's a choice. And the other thing from this stage in my life is Jack Kerouac said that life is it's, it's just a great, strange dream. But I feel so grateful. I'm very interested in, I think gr gratitude is, is a huge component in being content and also pulling yourself out of depression. It sounds yeah. trite to say count your blessings. And the thing that I went through was not just cognitive or attitudinal. It was clearly a neurochemical, biological, uh, genetic susceptibility. But there is that the cognitive component does count as well. Just the idea of, of being grateful for, for every day that, yeah. that we're alive. Just every, every day is a fresh start and a, and, a, and a reason to rejoice. But the other thing that I'm that uh, is a little bit of a hobby horse for me right now. And my wife teases me about it is graciousness, being gracious mm -hmm. to everybody. Mm -hmm. for, for just saying something nice to everybody you meet. It's amazing how that kind of thing becomes infectious, contagious, mm -hmm. that ramifies. I define graciousness as courtesy amplified by generosity. And when I say generosity, I'm not meaning not giving big tips or money. I mean, just generosity of spirit. Yeah. And you definitely have that. And I think it's interesting if we tie that back to Fred Rogers, he certainly would modeled that. For sure. Yes. Well, one of his favorite sayings was you've made this day very special just by being you, that kind yeah, of idea. That. There's something yeah. this Well, the Quakers believe in the divine light. Everybody has a divine light. That's helpful for, us to want to be that divine person. We want to be the best person that we can be in all situations. And not that we're going to always make it happen, but it is a thing to aspire to. And it does help, at least I find, turn you from your worst tendencies. Yeah. But I also think that the idea is that everybody has a treasure. Everybody has a gem, mm -hmm. is sort of a gem in some way. And, and that's why I'm so curious. That's why I ask people questions because I like to try to discover that, plumb their being or their soul or whatever, and find out what is that special spark yeah. or whatever it is that makes them unique and interesting. And sometimes I'll tell people, I'm so glad that that we are sharing the same time on the planet, that mm. we're making this passage together. How fortunate it is that our paths cross and well, I'm so thankful that our paths have crossed, Art. Well, thank you, Donna. Thank this you so fun. much. It has yes, been absolutely. so fun. And I'm yes. sure there's more There's more out there that we can cover, but I really yeah, appreciate our time together. Yeah, we didn't even talk about, about the, 
the Holy Trinity of Fitness. And I know we didn't. And Body for Life and Jack Bogle. But maybe you'll come back. That would Certainly. be nice. All right. Certainly. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Well, it was a pleasure and thank you for inviting me. That's all for today. If you want to learn more about arts books, writings, and editing services, those links will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this episode has been helpful. And if it was, please subscribe, drop a review, or share it with your friends and family. That's the best way to get it in the hands of those who may benefit. And if my daughters, Sienna and Sylvia, are listening, I just want you to know how proud I am of you. And I love you so much. Bye now.